So uh, this whole idea of, of wealth is seductive. It can lead us into paths of unrighteousness instead of paths of righteousness. It, it leads us to this false sense of security, this sense that I'm going to have some degree of power and, and authority over other people. And so we want to be careful about that. So let's look in Mark chapter 10 today. We're going to finish up where Pete left off last night. In Mark chapter 10, beginning in uh, verse 28, we're going to look at verses 28 to 31. But we'll ramp up with a little review this morning. You recall that Jesus had set this Im seemingly impossible standard for those who are wealthy. An impossible standard. He's telling this rich young man, uh, this young man came to him, knelt before Jesus, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus uh, said, you must keep the commandments. And he said, well, I've kept them all. Uh, and Jesus says, well, there's one thing you lack. And he said, well, what's that? And he said, all you need to do, we know this man was rich from the parallel passage. So all you need to do is sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you can uh, have eternal life. Now, selling all you have and giving to the poor does not get you into the kingdom of God. What was, what was Jesus really telling him? Your focus, your your sense of security in life, your salvation in your mind is your money. You think your money's going to save you, and in fact, it's going to kill you. You need to give it all away because it's corrupting your life and it's keeping you from the kingdom of God. The very thing that you want, your money is keeping you from. So Jesus tells him that, and what was the response of the rich, rich young ruler? He was very sad, and he, he went away sad because he wasn't willing to give up the very thing that was keeping him from what, he was, from what he was asking. From what he was asking. So, now his disciples' response, remember the disciples' response? You remember what it says? It says that they were, they were amazed. They were amazed at, his, at, 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 at the response. Why? Because in the Jewish society, which wasn't a lot different than ours today, uh, the wealthier you are, the more fill in the blank. Blessed you are by God. The more God must like you. God must, put, must think favorably upon you. After all, he's given you wealth and the power to make wealth. Come think of thinking about Deuteronomy 18, you know, 18, 8, you know, the Lord, it is the Lord your God who's given you power to make wealth. Well, they leave off the rest, you know, that so that we might bless the Lord, that we might honor the Lord, that we might give to the Lord. And they thought the wealthier were the more alms you could give a token of what you had. Therefore, that buys you greater favor with the Lord. So, um, so Jesus responds and he says, um, um, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we don't have to, I'm sure you know, Pete got into the camel and the eye of the needle. The whole, the whole point of here is what? It's incredibly difficult because of this seduction of riches for wealthy people, people that have a lot. Now, it's really interesting, wealth is relative uh, in the world, is it not? I mean, if you live in a house with four walls and a, and a, and a, um, a washing machine and dryer and heating and air conditioning, uh, you are immensely wealthy compared to the rest of the world. But we are in the business of comparing ourselves with other people, are we not? Absolutely. No matter how much wealth a person has, the guy who is the second wealthiest person in the world is constantly checking out what? The next guy, right? I mean, so uh, uh, Bezos is, what's his first name? Jeff. Jeff Bezos is all worried about Elon Musk. He's checking the stock, stock numbers every day to see if maybe, you know, he pulled past it. That's the way we are. So the disciples, they're hearing Jesus say this, and they are exceedingly astonished. They're exceedingly ex ex astonished. Why? Because uh, who can be saved? If it's if that hard, who can be saved? Well, thank God for Jesus' response. Um, he says, with man, uh, it's impossible. But the good news is what? With God, all things are possible. All, it means that you can be saved. You could, that which is utterly impossible, not just for rich people, but for anyone. You can actually be saved. 
That which is impossible can be made possible through the grace of our Lord Jesus, through the grace of God. That's what we heard Pastor Mike preach about today. So it's interesting um, that um, Jesus' response, it says in verse 27, it says, when he said, when they said, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them. He looked at them. Now, get the picture here. We can go over this so quickly. It's just like, this is like the look, you know? So who can be saved? And Jesus, don't you realize with, with man, it's impossible? That's the whole point. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So that's, that's Jesus' response. It's a, it's a glorious moment of, of uh, Jesus' grace and that a glimpse of the glory of the gospel. A glimpse of the glory of the gospel. Apart from his grace, apart from God's intervention in our lives, no one can be saved. So what's interesting about this passage as we jump into this is, and we're kind of, immersed in it already, is that Jesus seems to be using wealthy people as an illustration of the impossibility of being saved. This isn't all about wealthy people, but we can say, oh, this doesn't apply to me. That's only those guys. Now, what he's really saying is that, um, that uh, Jesus, that he's talking about wealthy people, not as a singular class, but an example of how difficult it is for anyone to enter the kingdom of God. Um, if you look at verse 43, before, I mean, excuse me, verse 24, look at verse 24. It, 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 Jesus doesn't limit his comment to rich people only. He says, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. That is the statement. Apart from the grace of God and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, no one can be saved. Let's keep in mind, uh, John uh, chapter 1 um, one well, very familiar passage, but if you look at verses 11 to 13, he came into his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who did the giving? Who did the giving? God gave the giving. God gave the right. Who were born not of the blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but what? But God. But God. Who, whose will was it? Was it my idea? Was it your idea? No, it was God's idea who chose to miraculously and amazingly intervene in our lives, to intercept us by the work of his Holy Spirit, to convict us of our own sin, to reveal to us that which is impossible for us to see. As Pastor Mike said, the eyes of faith make clear that which sin obscures. He said that this morning, did you not hear it? It is God working in us to work and to do his good pleasure, to enable us to see what we could never see on our own. So the rich people are a particular example. We talked a little bit about that. Well, I'm not sure what's on the, on the video right now because we talked beforehand. But you know, why, why does Jesus use the rich people as, a, as an example? Well, because they tend to trust in their riches. We've talked about that. Uh, it, also, it gives a sense of false security that I've got things together, I've got, I've, my portfolio is diversified. You know, I can weather the storms. Ask the wealthy people who jumped out of windows in the 1929 depression when it started in Wall Street. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 17 is appropriate. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us everything to enjoy. You want true riches. Trust in God. Believe in God. Rest in Him. Trust Him for all sufficiency in all things, just as He has promised us. Don't be haughty. And the second thing is that, uh, that, that um, rich people tend to focus too much on material things. The more you have, the more you worry about the things you have and hanging on to them. You know, this is really important. You know, God needs to purify us from that, that seduction. Uh, I've shared before in this class when it's now 13 years ago. I remember like yesterday because when Cindy and I were visiting Rebecca, our daughter, in Dominican Republic, we get a phone call, your house is burning. Matthew's on the phone. Your house is burning. You're going to lose everything. It's all going to burn. And we, we that was an amazing moment. It really was. Um, wait a minute. All the things that 
the material things we have are, are things that we, like, are, are, that we, our memories of, of all our years of marriage, gone. Your house is going to burn. And you know what, had to, what happened? We had to, at that moment, make a decision. Lord, I release all the material things that we've ever owned, all the memories of our kids' childhood, all their little treasures they brought home. Now, Lord, we got all the, the, the knickknacks and the furnishings and the photos. This all going to be gone. And even classic cars. You know what? They're going to be gone and just release them. It's okay. We really, we were able to do that in a moment. And that was so important for us. Now, by God's grace, the house was miraculously saved and we were able to go back to it. But that wasn't the point. You know, whether it was saved or not saved didn't matter because we were able to let it go. <sighs> hmm. So, you know, uh, John... Um, 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with his desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Wow. There's the contrast. We're going to depend on the things of the world. Are we going to strive to, to, to get everything we can in life and to hang on to it and spend our life hanging on and hanging on? Are we going to be satisfied with all the riches of Christ in glory? Hmm. Where is our satisfaction? Where is our hope? Where do we rest? That's the question. So now we come to verse 28. And Peter saying to, saying, so Jesus said, unless you, unless you leave everything, uh, you're, you're, if, if you leave every, you have to leave everything, um, you're not going to be saved. And Jesus, Peter responds to him in verse 28, and he says, and Peter said, uh, began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you, verse 29 now. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake or for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life, eternal life. Well, what do you think Peter was thinking when he, when he asked Jesus, when he told Jesus, see, we've left everything. He's speaking for himself and for all the disciples. Why do you think Peter said that? Well, I think uh, he had been listening pretty intently to Jesus and he was worried. He was worried. Maybe Peter was thinking, you know, I'm pretty wealthy actually in this world. I mean, he was a successful fisherman, remember that? And he had a house. We know he had a house because we read earlier in Mark that, that Jesus visited Peter's house. His mother-in-law was there who was ill, remember that? People crowded into the house. Well, it must have been a pretty good size house. And uh, the fact that he had a house with four walls uh, was pretty impressive for that day and that age. So Peter's thinking, well, maybe, and he had a boat. Yeah all that. You know what? Maybe he was pretty wealthy by the world's standards. He was beginning to worry a little bit, and he's, and he's saying, well, well, wait a minute. Um, well, I, I and the other disciples, we've already done what Jesus has required. We left our, our families. We left our children. We, we left our jobs. We came and we followed you. So, uh, He's thinking that. And he's all, probably also thinking that some of Jesus' earlier followers didn't follow him. We know from uh, John 6, 66, you don't have to turn there, it says, after Jesus had said, uh, no one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Peter's saying, wait a minute. Uh, no, we followed you. We stayed with you. We were loyal to you. So they've given up a lot, but he wanted assurance. Had they passed the eye of the needle test? Well, of course, what was going on with Peter? Well, he's a little off, wasn't he? You know, he's thinking there must be some standard of giving. There must be some standard of letting go. There must be some standard of sacrifice that will enable me to be worthy of you, Lord Jesus. And he... And he Kind of was missing the point a little bit, as he so often, often did. Often did. Uh, were he and the disciples to be the recipients of Jesus' promises of eternal life? 
So Jesus gives them this wonderful, uh, one of his many uh, over-the-top responses. He says, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children, we're in verse 29, for my sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Well, what was Jesus saying? He's saying that becoming a true believer, truly following him in faith, the faith of a child, as he's been emphasizing previously over and over, he says, if you come to me like that, you've made the greatest investment a person could ever hope to make, the one that gives, gives dividends for eternity. But you don't have to wait until eternity. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't have to wait. You give us all the riches of Christ and his glory starting today. And if you've given up your, your, your family, if you've given up your wealth, God will repay you. Maybe not in material things and physical things. He will repay you in things that really matter and that reverberate into eternity. That investment, that great investment of faith in Christ the greatest investment anyone can ever hope to make is far greater than anything that we can ever hope to have in this world. Just think about it. Assurance of eternal life, not only now, but in the age to come. A peace that passes understanding, the, the fulfillment of the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden to his Father. We, we have the promise of hearts knit together in love to reach out, uh, to reach all the riches, all the fullness of assurance, of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ, who are hidden, who is in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's straight from Colossians chapter 2. And, and then Philippians 4.19, one verse that we know so well. God will supply how much? All our needs, our every need. God will supply our every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's the verse that we kind of go over a little flippantly on occasions. He'll provide all our needs according to the riches of Christ. His grace is sufficient. And that's where we need to be asking ourselves, where is my, where is my heart and where is my contentment? Am I satisfied in material things? Does that give me sufficiency? Does that give me security? Does that give me satisfaction? That's really the question that Jesus really is driving home here for us to think about. And then Colossians 1.27, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the contrast. Now, in reality, some people do give up a great deal when they receive by faith the gift, the greatest gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Uh, some people do really give up their families completely. Their families reject them when they come to faith in Christ. We've read these stories over and over again. If you're a Muslim today and come to faith in Christ, you will be shunned. Talk about cancel culture, you will be canceled. And even more and more today, a person who comes to faith in Christ from a family that is apart from him are not received with great joy. They wonder if maybe someone has gone off their rocker, if they've kind of lost it. And some give up lucrative careers to become missionaries or uh, serve the Lord in other ways. They just choose to do that because God has called them to do that. I, again, I've shared with you the, the, the retired family that I met uh, years ago. Uh, they were at a retreat uh, with, uh, for retiring Wycliffe missionaries, and I sat and had lunch with them. And, I said, what'd you do for Wycliffe? Well, we spent the, these are, by the way, Wycliffe people, to be, a, to be a, a translator for Wycliffe Bible translators, you have to have an advanced degree in linguistic or related field. So these are not dumb people. These are people that have poured their lives into, into their education. They could get a, a really good job at a university. Instead, they choose to go live in the jungle, literally the jungle. He says, yeah, we were in Papua New Guinea. I've been there. It's, 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 they don't have a lot of uh, Marriott Marquis there, I assure you. They don't even have a day's end. They don't have anything. These people lived in the jungle. He said, yeah, we lived in a tribe of about 200 people, and we spent 20 years there, and we, 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 translated the New we learned their language, and we translated the New Testament for 20 years. You did that? You spent 20 years for 200 people? Yeah, we did. Well, 
well, you were there longer, what'd you do next? He said, oh, we went over the hill. These language groups are just a few hundred people. We went over the hill, we took a break, then we went over the hill, and we spent the next 20 years translating the New Testament for the next language group. Yes. And now we're retired. <laughs> what a waste of your life, the world would say. You, you spent 40 years of your life translating the Bible for like 400 people? That's what you did? When you could have... And you got the story, right? Well, let's think about that for just a minute. Let's think about that. How are you going to spend your life? Where are you going to, where are you going to build up the true riches? It be in material things? It can be the things of God. Jesus is saying, those who faithfully follow Jesus will be rewarded in this age and the age to come. But there is a condition. The condition is putting Jesus first, even before the houses or the brothers or the sisters or the mother or the father or the children of land. He said, you don't have to literally walk away from your family. In fact, we know from, the, from, the, from Scripture that we're to be faithful parents and, and we're to love those in our family, love the fellow believers. What he's saying, though, is that if Jesus is first, we'll have all the blessings of what, family, what a family really should be. Now, there are times when families are lost and families reject believers. We understand that. But what he's saying is the condition is that you love me first for my sake and for the gospel. That's what he was saying. Those who put Jesus first will receive blessings a hundredfold. All that we give up for Jesus will be giving back beyond measure, whether in this life or the life to come. That is the promise. So when we give up the material things of this world, we gain all the riches of the glory of Christ, both now and in the world to come. The condition simply means that we must be willing to put Jesus first, trusting in him to make all things new. He will someday, Jesus said, he'll, for those things that we lose in this world, we think we lose, Jesus said he'll wipe away every tear. He'll make all things new. He'll give us new bodies, a new heaven, a new earth, all for his eternal glory. And I believe there'll be glorious reunions in heaven when all the saints come together for the very first time in all of history. The saints of all of history will come together and we'll meet for the first time. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. The lesson here is that we cannot outgive God Whatever we sacrifice for his sake and for the sake of the gospel will be returned to us. Whatever we give up and whatever we give, God will give back. It reminds you of Luke chapter 6, um, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will pour into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. That's the picture of giving and giving up. And sometimes it's a lot harder to give up than it is to give. Don't you think? It's easy to give, but to give up the things that we cling to that feel so important to us, the mementos, the, the, the meager savings that we might have, the material things of this world. Are we really, your house is burning. It's all going to go. Are you willing to give it up? And thank God for the time that he loaned it to you. That's the question. Oh, there's one other condition, or one other element of giving up that we maybe quickly overlook. Notice here it says, um, there's no one who's left his house or brothers or sisters or mother or father. Look at verse 30. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in the in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution, with persecution. What goes with all the things that we give up is you've given up so much, and by the way, you're still going to be persecuted. You're still going to suffer for my name's sake. Jesus said the world's going to hate you. Acts chapter 14, um, it says this in verse 19, but the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went with Barnabas to Derbe. I'm in Acts chapter 14, verse 21 now. 
And they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. How's that for a sermon? Jesus, I mean, uh, Paul is beaten within a, 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 an inch of his life. They thought he was dead. He gets up and he ministers more. And he goes back uh, to these cities and he, and, he, and he preaches to them and he encourages them. And, he, and in his courage, when he says, oh, by the way, you're going to experience tribulations before you can enter the kingdom of God. It goes hand in hand. There will be hard, you think, you think there will be uh, more tribulation in the coming days or less? What do you think? It's you feeling it all around you, do you not? I mean, did you see the NCAA, NCAA wants to ban uh, on those? Are, excuse me. There are many who are, are, uh, are petitioning the NCAA to ban uh, Oral Roberts University from playing in the uh, Sweet 16 basketball tournament. Why? Well, they're a bunch of hypocrites and bigots, right? Because they believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Uh, they, they believe in the sanctity of life. They believe that, that there should be a code of conduct, some Byzantine Neanderthal conduct that said that you, you really should not uh, live with a person uh, until you're married. I mean, things like that. I mean, it's just how arcane. Uh, they're hate, they're hate, hateful people. We're going to hear that more and more and more. And there will become a day, and I believe it will still be in our lifetimes, when uh, Christians will be restricted from some jobs, maybe many, many jobs, someday even most jobs because of your faith. Are you ready for that? Jesus says, when you suffer persecutions, when you suffer for Christ's sake, all the riches of glory are still yours. John 15 uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as, your share in, as you share in Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Don't be surprised. Thank God, rejoice because we share in his sufferings. Jesus said in John 15, 9, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world what? The world hates you. The world will hate you. If you truly follow Jesus, the world will hate you. There will be suffering. And those days are coming upon us greater than ever before. Well, Jesus ends now in verse 31. He says, But many who are first will be last and the last first. What's he mean by that? Well, he's simply saying this, that there is a blessing for those who truly trust in him. There, 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 it reminds you of Matthew 5, of the, the Beatitudes. The first Beatitude says, uh, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are last, those who are considered the lowly of this world, those who are truly mourning, as he says in the next Beatitude, their sin. Those that don't really think too highly of themselves, those who are truly humble, not, they're not Eeyores that are down on themselves constantly. They just have a realistic view of their own sinfulness. And by the way, the world hates uh, believers because um, we acknowledge that we're sin, sinful, and we're sinners. You know, I think there's a, an irony in the Christian faith. Our relationship with Christ turns the world system upside down if you look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is an important passage. Um, I'll, I'll jump down to verse uh, 27. But God chose, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, but God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what's low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, God's promise um, of equality for every believer is nothing like man's futile attempt to somehow guarantee everyone will be equal. 
and that will have uh, equal uh, outcomes in this world. It's, you know, there's a bill in Congress right now, it's called the Equality Act. In many ways, it op promises exactly the opposite. I don't want to get into that, but let me just tell you this, that, that, that all that the world's ever tried to make people equal never, never works. It cannot work. I mean, communist socialist countries have plenty of billionaires. Do you know that? There's over 300 billionaires in communist China. There's 67 in Hong Kong. You know, the world system will never make everyone rich. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. The Bible makes it clear that those who are rich in this world have an added responsibility to take, not take advantage of the poor, but to help them. This Bible is full of verses, and the time is up this morning. But uh, let me just tell you that there's plenty in there that gives added charge to those who are wealthy. You can take down these verses and look at them yourself. Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8, a charge to care for those who are poor among you. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8. Psalm 10, 2, 10, 2. Psalm 10, 2. In, wicked, uh, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the, schemes that they, in the schemes that they have devised. Isaiah 3, 14 and 15, this is a really important one, about those who devour the poor. Isaiah 3, 14 and 15. Zechariah 7, 8 to 10. God will render true judgments, true judgments, and he'll show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. Let none of you devise evil again against another in your heart. So the Lord will decide who's going to be rich. He makes that clear, 1 Samuel 2, 7 and 8. The Lord makes poor and the rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap. He makes them set with princes and inherit a seat of honor. So all of these things are in the sovereign hand of the Lord. Again, Deuteronomy 8, 18. It is God who gives you power to make wealth. So let's be clear that it is of the Lord. If he chooses to, to give to you, we have a lot of young people here today. Should God choose to give you a measure of wealth? God is also saying, I'm going to trust you to use that to help others and to be wise in the use of that which God has given to you. And he will hold you to a greater level of accountability. I believe just as James 3.1 tells you, that let not many of you become rabbis, teachers, who were, by the way, mostly really wealthy. Let not many of you become teachers, for you will be held to a greater judgment. That's sobering, is it not? So if you want to be rich, young people, anybody, right? If you want to be rich, be rich for God first. Be rich for Him. Be rich in Him. Be satisfied with that. And should He grant you over and above that which you already have, may He find you faithful. May He find all of us faithful in using that which He has granted to us for His glory and His purpose. And let us not forget, in this country, in this day, if you live in that house that we talked about first of all, if you drive a car, you got a job, you are wealthy by the world's standards. May God find us faithful no matter how little we have or how much we have, that we might use it for his purpose and for his glory. Amen? You bet. Lord, thank you for our time. We're grateful that we can immerse ourselves in the power of your word, in the glory of your word, in the riches of Christ. Lord, may we be satisfied in that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.